Everyone needs a pastor. A visit to the pastor's study brings biblically faithful pastoral ministry to you and pastoral ministry from those with proven experience in Christian service. Our time together will be lively, sometimes controversial, always useful, and never dull. Welcome to the study of Pastor Bill Shishko. And this is Pastor Bill Shishko here with you. It's great to have you with us for another visit to the pastor's study. Piety, well, that's a word we don't use very much today. It means devotion to God and specifically to the true and living God who makes himself known as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And because this true and living God is absolutely just and absolutely holy, and because by nature we are absolutely sinners, well, our devotion to him must begin with a mediator, one who can bridge the gap between unholy people and this holy God, and I might add very unholy people and a very holy God. Well, the mediator is Jesus Christ, the God-man, and the Bible, the Word of God, presents Jesus Christ to us in in the most glowing terms. He's the altogether lovely one, the fairest among 10,000, the most beautiful of all beings. He's the pearl of great price, and he's full of grace and truth. Now, the good news is that he becomes our husband when we respond to the gospel, the good news that he gave himself to deliver men and women and boys and girls from sin and death, and the good news that he promises any guarantees everlasting life to those who commit themselves to him in faith and who follow him faithfully as their Lord. And we love him because he first loved us and he loves us. Well, true piety is devotion to God that grows out of love for Christ, love for a very lovely and a very wonderful Savior. Well, in the entire history of the Christian church, I don't think that kind of piety has been demonstrated any more beautifully and richly than by a man named Samuel Rutherford. Samuel Rutherford was born into a farming family in the year 1600 in Scotland. Even in his boyhood, he demonstrated sensitivity to the things of God. Following his training for the Christian ministry in 1627, he was ordained and installed as pastor of a congregation in Anwath in southwest Scotland. And for nine years, he carried out a pastoral ministry that was a model of the piety and the service of a truly godly minister. Here, here's a description from someone who knew Rutherford as a man, as a man who truly gave himself for the eternal good of others. He rises, the man wrote, at three in the morning, and at that early hour meets his God in prayer and meditation, and has time for study besides. He takes occasional days for catechizing, that is to teach people the Christian faith in a systematic way. He never fails to be found at the sick beds of his congregation members. People say of him, he's always praying, always preaching, always visiting the sick, always catechizing, always writing and studying. But it was it was love for Christ that more than anything else marked the life and service of Samuel Rutherford. That same writer continued, he was known to fall asleep at night talking of Christ and even to speak of him during his sleep. Indeed, he himself speaks of his dreams being of Christ. An English businessman who was familiar with many of the ministers in Samuel Rutherford's day made this observation in his own quaint way. I heard a a well-favored, proper old man with a long beard, and that man showed me all my heart. Then I heard a sweet, majestic-looking man, and he showed me the majesty of God. After him, I heard a little fair man, and he showed me the loveliness of Christ. Well, that fair man was Samuel Rutherford, and that man of the past, 17th century to be exact, is the subject of our program today. You see, the Bible speaks of those who are dead but still speak, that is, their lives and ministry should continue to minister to us and simply shouldn't be forgotten. Samuel Rutherford, who lived between 1600 and 1661, shouldn't be forgotten. 
While he's known for his writings about Christian doctrine, his biblical development of the subjects of both church and civil government, in fact, his views of civil government strongly influenced the formation of our American Republic, Samuel Rutherford is best known for his devotion to Christ and his unmatched expressions of love for Christ. That devotion is preserved for us particularly in 365 letters that he composed, most of them while he was suffering imprisonment for the sake of the gospel. And those letters have been called the most remarkable series of devotional letters in the history of the Protestant Reformation, and I couldn't agree with that more. Well, later in the program, you'll hear how you can get some of Samuel Rutherford's devotional writings for yourself. But for now, I have two guests who will whet your appetite for Samuel Rutherford and his piety. Both are Scots. One lives in Scotland and the other here in the United States. Matthew Vogan is a trustee of the Scottish Reformation Society and manager of the Reformation Scotland Trust, a group that mines the riches of past spiritual wisdom and works hard to make those riches available to enrich the 21st century church. And we're glad to have Matthew with us today via Skype. Jim Campbell is a minister of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church who lives here in the United States in Connecticut and who's always glad to tell people about all things Scottish. Well, you may have never heard of Samuel Rutherford before, but I guarantee you that by the end of the program, you will be as captivated by Samuel Rutherford as Matthew and Jim are, and I might add, as I am. But more than that, you'll be, and we want you to be captivated by the one Samuel Rutherford loved, served, and worshipped, Jesus Christ. Remember that this program invites you to visit the pastor's study by way of your phone calls or texts. To be on air as part of the program, just call 631 955 Five four zero zero six three one nine five 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 four zero zero, or you can text your questions, and you can do that any time during the week. We gather together questions that become part of our monthly open forums, we call them. But whether you want to have a texted question for this program or for the future, the number for text questions only five one six three six seven zero three nine one. Put that under Pastor Bill. Five one six three six seven zero three nine one. I do love to get your text questions. It's a way of me keeping that contact with you as a pastor via uh, the me- means of electronic communication. Anyway, for now, Matthew Vogan and Jim Campbell. Hey, welcome to a visit to the pastor's study. Welcome, Matthew. Thank you very much. And welcome, Jim. Hey, Bill. I'm here. Oh, <laughs> you, you sound right ready to go. Hey, let me start, Matthew, with you. Why don't you tell us a little more about the time in which Samuel Rutherford both lived and wrote? Sure. Well, just briefly, I think there are three um, specific ways in which we can characterize his time. The first is that it was a time of conflict. So there was a struggle really between the church and the state at the time with the the state wanting to control the church. And the government actually removed Rutherford from his congregation and exiled him all the way up to the north of Scotland, to Aberdeen, because he wouldn't keep silent about the errors that were being forced in on the church. What the government were trying to do was to unravel aspects of the Reformation in Scotland. And there were many like Rutherford who suffered for opposing that. But shortly after that, and this is the second way I would characterise it, it was a time of reformation. So the time came rather suddenly when there was an opportunity to resist the way that the king was forcing changes on the church in Scotland. And so the nation came together to sign the National Covenant in 1638. And this was them pledging to uphold the reformation. And in fact, that started a reformation movement that would ultimately ultimately result in the Westminster Assembly in the 1640s, where Rutherford himself would have an important role. And the third way I would uh, characterise the time is that it was a time of revival. And that's not something that's um, widely appreciated. It was a, a revival that went further and lasted longer than any other in Scotland's history. It revolutionised the whole nation and deeply affected it with multitudes being converted and church life transformed. 
but it also went very deep into people's personal lives and their spiritual experience. And that's why Rutherford's preaching and letters were so highly valued at the time. Now, if people want to learn more about the period, we've got some free online videos that they can look at at scotlandsforgottenhistory.com, oh. scotlandsforgottenhistory.com. Yeah. Okay. Know, what I'm struck with, Matthew, and this was for another program, those those are, are three things we so much need in our own day. Uh, the fact that the church must must live under under the, the sole kingship of Jesus Christ. We are certainly in need of, of biblical reformation and, and obviously revival. Thank you for kind of encapsulating sure. that yeah. for us. Um, but let's, let's talk about how Samuel Rutherford communicated the loveliness of Christ. And, and, and Jim, Rutherford wrote, and, and I'm paraphrasing a bit, Oh, but Christ is heaven's wonder and earth's wonder. What marvel that his bride, the church, says he's altogether lovely. That's language from the Song of Solomon. Oh, that, quoting Rutherford again, Oh, that people will not come and bring all their love to this fair one. Oh, you poor, dry, and dead souls. Why will you not come with your empty souls to this huge and fair and deep and sweet well of life and fill your empty vessels. I mean, we, we don't speak like that today. Jim, open open that up for us a little bit. Well, it seems to me, uh, Bill, that what we have here is a very personal expression of biblical models, both in the Old and New Testament, about our desire to uh, be one with the Savior. Um, when I was preparing my remarks uh, for today, actually a couple of weeks ago, I happened upon Psalm 84.2, and that verse seemed to me to speak to Rutherford. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Uh, the essence of all this, it seems to me, is a simple statement. Christianity involves salvation through a relationship with Christ. We're saved, as we say, by a righteousness, not our own. Jesus said, come unto me. He didn't say, come unto it. Not just to an idea or a movement or a group or an endeavor, but to Christ, a person. Uh, and I think that, frankly, we're all too content with the ordinary routine of our Christian life. I know I am. Uh, and Rutherford calls us to move on in that aspect of Christianity, which is at its base, which is a relationship with Christ. Um, one of the letters uh, has the following phrase. He, he talks about ascending to the mountain of the Lord, ravishments of spiritual love. And then he says to, to experience the glory and excellency, and these words are important, of a seen, revealed, felt, and embraced Christ. And I think that's what Rutherford not only is trying to instill, but also was very successful in achieving for himself. And Jim, we're probably jumping ahead a little bit here, but obviously we don't see Christ. That's the challenge we all face. We, we, we don't see him, and we're not to picture him. So how do you develop that, that kind of a, of a personal relationship with someone you don't see? Well, I think you do it, first of all, by using the means available to us that he has instituted. We don't seek some kind of uh, 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 unusual or unique experience uh, out of our body or something along that line. What do we have? We have, what, what do we call them? The means of grace. We have the word that we can read and it can be preached in our hearing. We have the sacraments, particularly the sacrament of the Lord's Supper that we can uh, uh, participate in. And we have prayer. Uh, we're not all going to be Samuel Rutherford's but we're all going to be able to use those means to grow in our knowledge of that relationship. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Matthew, in our correspondence, as we were preparing for the program, and I want to express my thanks for the amount of work these two brothers did on, on this topic. We're giving you, we're not even giving you the cream, we're just giving you a part of the cream of the preparation. But, but Matthew, you wrote that, I'm quoting you now, Rutherford would say that we cannot, but love, this is how we are constituted. The question is, and again quoting you, to whom or what will we give our preeminent affections? People seek to satisfy the desires of the soul in created things in this world or in other people. They're seeking to satisfy a desire for the infinite 
in the finite. And again, you're writing, that's impossible. They're looking in the wrong place. As Rutherford sometimes said, now, now you're quoting him, seeking spiritual satisfaction in this world is like digging down into cold ice, expecting that we will find warm fire. No one is more worthy of our affections than Christ as the God-man. Matthew, how did Samuel Rutherford find such spiritual satisfaction in Jesus Christ? Sure. Well, um, he was someone who was had these desires for the Lord Jesus Christ and he spent much time and this is what he would say to us spend much time in secret with Christ if you love someone you want to be with them you want to converse with them and so that that's what he was he was saying make make more time for Christ and, and he would say that these spiritual desires and and finding satisfying those spiritual desires in Christ. It's a bit like uh, a hunger, really. Um, if if you've got a physical hunger, you can do things to suppress uh, that physical appetite. You know, if you're very busy and it's really noisy, you're distracted from feeling hungry and you can snack on bits and pieces that aren't necessarily nourishing or enjoyable, but it makes you less hungry. But then you aren't really hungry for a good meal either and that's what it's like in a spiritual sense we're so busy and our lives are so filled up with the things of this world that it takes away our appetite and our time for being satisfied in christ and what he would say to us is value christ according to his true value compared with other things so once you start to see actually how brief and how disappointing the things of this world are you need to see how Christ is eternal, he's infinite, and there's all spiritual blessings uh, in him. And, and there are deepest needs, obviously. And, and when you talk about spending uh, time alone with Christ, Matthew, that's that's with Christ as he's made known by his word, correct? Exactly, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's very important for our listeners to keep in mind that the Bible there was a, an old Scottish preacher who was wont to say to people, the Bible is about two things, sin and Jesus. And that's that's pretty much right. And as you're reading the scriptures, you want to, to learn about him, as, as the writer David Murray has put it, Christ on, on every page. Again, quoting Rutherford, Oh, what an excellent, lovely, ravishing one is Jesus. Put the beauty of 10,000, thousand worlds of paradises like the Garden of Eden in one. Put all trees, all flowers, all smells, all colors, all tastes, all joys, all sweetness, all loveliness in one. What an excellent thing that would be. And yet, it would be less to that fair and dearest, well-beloved Christ than one drop of rain to all the seas, rivers, lakes and fountains of 10,000 earths how does a how does a person develop a love for Christ even 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 close to that jim well i think the first thing you need to do is to stop and think uh, somebody said once you know don't just stand there do something i think the opposite is true don't just be doing things stop and think there uh, the means of grace that I mentioned a moment ago but all those force us by their circumstance to look away from self to Christ the Bible has revealed to us a great deal about the Savior and we need to work at it frankly it doesn't just happen um, we need to work at it in the context I believe of biblical theology worship and practice I believe Rutherford is a tremendous asset to the Christian Church because he's safe, and I use that word to mean that he doesn't bring excess baggage from outside the scriptural revelation uh, that becomes a burden to our spirituality. He's a consistent Christian, and that's maybe what we need more of in our day. Matthew, do you want to add anything to that uh, in addition to what you'd mentioned before as far as how we develop that kind of love for Christ? 
Sure, I, th I think um, what Jim says is, is exactly right there. You, you need to consider deeply and turn over in your mind who Christ is, all that he is to you and what he has done for you and get your love for Christ inflamed. Once you start to see Christ in every page of scripture, as you said, then your love will be uh, increased. It's a bit like getting close to a fire. You have to stay there for a while in order to, to benefit from its heat. Yeah, that's and, great. And, yeah, excellent. And, and, and another thing I, I would add, you can tell we're all fans of Samuel Rutherford. It's taking the the ordinary things of life and seeing how Christ, as he's made known in the scriptures, is alive and at work and present. Uh, one of my many favorite quotations is, Rutherford, sure I am that it is better to be sick providing Christ come to the bedside and, and draw the curtains and, and say, and he quotes scripture here, courage, I am your salvation, than to enjoy health, being vigorous and strong, and never be visited by God. Wow, what a, what a, what a way of bringing the, the promises of the scriptures that are yes in Christ and, and, and making them applicable to the way we live today. Well, this is a visit to the pastor's study. We're dealing with the piety of Samuel Rutherford. You're going to hear about free book offers in just a little bit, and we'll be back with Matthew Vogan and Jim Campbell after this message from the voice of a visit to the pastor's study. That great city, New York. Metropolitan New York is the largest city in the United States. And with a population of over 20 million people, Metro New York is one of the largest cities in the world. And what's more, Metro New York is home to people from every nation of the world. To reach Metro New York is to reach the world. But churches faithful to historic Reformation Christianity in the Metro New York area are few and far between. The mission fields of Metro New York are America's richest, and most neglected. Reformation Metro New York is an agency by which the Orthodox Presbyterian Church is planting and developing biblically faithful churches and church ministries in the Metro New York area. Through Reformation Metro New York, you can help promote the outreach of this program, a visit to the pastor's study, and other projects designed to further the ongoing reformation of the church. That and church planting are the great passions of Reformation Metro New York. For more information, Information, check out the website at reformationmetrony.org where you'll get a personal look at the ministries of the churches, pastors, evangelists, and teachers of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in the area, and you'll learn how you can be a part of our labors. We need your help. Here's the site again, reformationmetrony.org. Thanks for your interest and your help. Remember that great city, New York. To reach Metro New York is to reach the world. Now back to today's edition of A Visit to the Pastor's Study. My guest today, Matthew Vogan of the Scottish Reformation Society and other worthy projects in Scotland, and James Campbell, minister in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church from Connecticut. We're dealing with the piety of Samuel Rutherford, that uh, 17th century figure whose uh, devotional writings still impact us today. We want them to impact you. If you have your questions, you can call in at 631 955 5400, 631 955. 5400, or you can text your questions about this topic or anything else, and at any time, text them to Pastor Bill at 516-367-0391, 516-367-0391. Stay tuned. We've got free book offers for you. But Matthew, Samuel Rutherford, as you mentioned, lived in difficult times. He experienced many of what's called frowning providences, painful times in his personal life. Tell us a little bit more about those. Sure. Um, well, Rutherford knew um, a lot of the sorrows of affliction personally. Um, for instance, his, his first wife died um, just when he was about the age of 30. You know, so he was, he, was, he was quite young. They hadn't been married for more than about five years. Um, and he also was, as we, we, we said, he was deposed from his pulpit, exiled far away from all his godly friends. And while he was engaged at the Westminster Assembly in London, two of his children died just during that, that period of time. And in fact, he had more than half a dozen children, but only one of them actually outlived him. Um, he knew deeply by his own experience that the wounds that affliction brings 
and makes on, on the spirit when he, when he sought to counsel others. So he was talking from experience. He was constantly in poor health and sometimes seriously ill. But I, I think sometimes spiritual afflictions and sorrows can be felt the deepest. And he saw the work of reformation that he labored for so unceasingly halted and other difficulties that afflicted both church and nation. And, and he was he was saying that sometimes those things would put him into the blackest uh, times in his life. Wow. Yeah. Let's, Matthew, I want to, in just a moment, I want to ask you a little bit more about Rutherford's view of what we often call cross-bearing. But Jim, let's step back a little bit. I mean, Rutherford lived in a very difficult time. He experienced, as Matthew said, many, so many personal difficulties but but I mean, is that world? It, it, I mean, is it the is it the same today? With the, we're not experienced, at least not yet, religious persecution. Ministers aren't booted out of their pulpits. I mean, we've had a lot of changes in medical care. There isn't the infant mortality rate. I, I, I mean, it, it, I, does what Rutherford say really really speak to to our day to day? Well, I think it does, Bill. First of all, we're not that far away from some of those things, uh, to be quite frank. Uh, it seems to me there's an increasingly hostile and secular world out there that doesn't want to hear the Christian gospel and certainly doesn't want to hear the full-orbed proclamation of it as it applies to civil matters as well as religious matters. I mean, Rutherford didn't run away and hide from life and its trials. He was a pastor to real people uh, there in Galloway. He was a teacher at St. Andrews commissioner of the Westminster Assembly. We aren't going to talk about it in the program, but he wrote a book called Lex Rex, uh, which is basically one of the most influential treatises on political theory from that century, affirming that the king was subject to the law. He studied all this stuff and reflected on it. But everything he did as a pastor, teacher, author, and commissioner, he did as a stranger and a pilgrim. He recognized what was important in his life. Uh, uh, one, one quote, uh, the world is one of the enemies that we have to fight with, but a vanquished and overcome enemy. And like a beaten and forlorn soldier, for our Lord Jesus has taken the armor from it. Let me speak uh, then to you in his words. Be a good cheer, says the captain of your salvation. I have overcome the world. Uh, the soldier's armor was taken away by Christ. It doesn't seem that way to me very often, and maybe reading Rutherford can help me to come to that proper understanding of the world. Yeah, the soldier there, of course, is the soldier that's an enemy of Christ, and my, how, right. how we need to hear, hear that in, in our day. Matthew, uh, Rutherford wrote frequently, uh, for obvious reasons now, about what we, what we call cross-bearing, but, but he did it in such personal ways. Uh, he wrote Christ's cross is neither a cruel nor unkind mercy, but the love token of a father. And, and this is one of my favorites. Um, he wrote this to a Christian woman following the death of her daughter. Know that the weightiest end of the cross of Christ that is laid upon you lies upon your strong Savior. For Isaiah says, in all your affliction, he was afflicted. Matthew, tell us more about Rutherford's approach to the cross and the Christian life. Yeah, well, as you can hear there, um, in one sense, it's quite simple. Christ, sorry, Rutherford had a Christ-centered approach to trials and afflictions. In fact, his approach to a particular trial was that he, he said, Christ and I will bear it, you know, Christ having the heavier end of the cross. And it was a comfort to him to, to know that all our troubles come through Christ's fingers. That's how he put it. Not just that they were being worked out for good, but that they were also being measured and limited by Christ's love. And, and he said that he was he would not want to forego all the bitterness of affliction if it meant being without the sweet experience of the comforts of God that he had together with them. So he called affliction and he, he put it in this way. Affliction is like a rough companion who can draw us to Christ. And that's what. The Apostle Paul's emphasis was, of course, he was saying we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation works patience and patience experience and experience hope. So he was able to draw this sweetness out of his trials. 
to the audience, if, if it sounds like, by these quotations, we are trying to whet your appetite to read Rutherford for yourself, you've got it. That's, that's exactly why we're doing this. I, this is another one of, of Rutherford's comments in a letter. Of course, infant mortality, the, the death of, of children, was very common uh, back in the 17th century when Rutherford lived. But he said, people do lop, that is prune or cut off, the branches of their trees round about to the end that they may grow up high and tall. The Lord has this way lopped your branch in taking from you, and this was following the death of one child, apparently a number of others had died, taking from you many children to the end, wrote Rutherford, that you should grow upward like one of the Lord's cedars, setting your heart above where Christ is at the right hand of God. Magnificent bringing together of, of biblical language and concepts uh, with, with the very real life experience. We're dealing today with the subject of the piety of the 17th century figure Samuel Rutherford that we all want uh, to make sure is not forgotten in this day. I'm thankful for the assistance of my of my guest Matthew Vogan from Scotland and, and Jim Campbell from Connecticut. Let me just take a moment though uh, to tell you in a moment, I'm going to tell you about how you can get some of Rutherford. But first, um, a word. This is a word from our sponsor, if you will. It's a group of of churches in uh, the Connecticut and metropolitan New York area who present a visit to the pastor's study to you, and it's just part of our outreach. Uh, these are this is uh, Harvest Orthodox Presbyterian Church in East Haddam, Connecticut. Uh, Westminster Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Hamden, Connecticut, uh, where, where Jim Campbell is Teacher Campbell, serving there as a minister, uh, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Mount Vernon, New York, and then uh, right here in, in, in the metropolitan New York area in Fresh Meadows, Queens, Reformation Presbyterian Church, and then on Long Island, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Franklin Square, uh, Trinity Church in Syosset, and then the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Bohemia. Now, these are not the only faithful churches in our area, but we want you in faithful churches, and these these we can recommend to you. A visit to the Pastor's Study has its own website, all one word, visit thepastorsstudy.org, and there you'll find from the past uh, some programs that are, are related to what we did today. Another uh, that I did with, with uh, Pastor Campbell is the importance of creeds and confessions, uh, that we did together in January 2017, and then the Protestant Reformation's 500th anniversary program uh, that I did with Dr. Carl Truman in October of 2017. We did similar things about the great Protestant reformer Martin Luther, and, and especially Luther's view of the Christian life. But we call these magazine articles for the year, and we'd love to have you uh, access these on the podcast to a visit to the pastor's study. Like us and follow us on Facebook, and also, again, it's a visit to the pastor's study. We've got that name. And then my email, if you'd like to communicate with me personally, is visit Pastor Bill. That's all one word. Very easy. Visit Pastor Bill at Gmail. Now, last but not least, we're dealing with the piety of Samuel Rutherford. And this week, uh, courtesy of Reformation Heritage Books and Matthew Vogan, uh, who edited uh, this particular volume, uh, we have uh, the volume The King in His Beauty on the Piety of Samuel Rutherford, edited and introduced by Matthew Vogan. Uh, we've whet your appetite, and there's there, I mean, sections in here that are magnificent, especially as you're preparing for your Lord's Day, uh, articles by Rutherford, excerpts from his writings on unsearchable grace, confession of sin. Here's a beautiful one, the Rose of Sharon, the Fragrance of Grace, the God-Man, Life Which Cannot Be Lost, the Hope of Glory, All Things for Good, Wow. And all you've got to do is uh, make a request for this, or you can't give you both, but we give you one or the other. The other is actually a selection of the letters of Samuel Rutherford. It's part of the Puritan paperback series from our friends at the Banner of Truth Trust. Uh, this is actually 69 
of the 365 letters in the complete edition of Rutherford's Letters, which is also available from the Banner of Truth Trust. Uh, But if you'd like a copy of the Letters of Samuel Rutherford or The King and His Beauty, all you've got to do is uh, send, you've got to send your name and mailing address. We can't mail it to you if we don't have your mailing address, uh, but send that information with your request for one or the other of the books to visit Pastor Bill at gmail.com. Visit Pastor Bill at gmail.com. My guest today, again, Matthew Vogan of the Scottish Reformation Society and also uh, Pastor Jim Campbell. If you'd like to call with your questions about the piety of Samuel Rutherford or piety in our day, 631-955-5400. Or you can text your questions anytime, 516-367-0391. Matthew, tell us a little about Samuel Rutherford. You've mentioned he's a pastor Tell us a little bit about Rutherford as a pastor, and and what should pastors today learn from Rutherford? Sure. Well, that's a really good um, inquiry, because being a pastor was what Rutherford loved best, and and it's what he most wanted to do. And if I could take a pastor from today to scenes in Rutherford's life, I would take him, first of all, to Rutherford's deathbed. And he's there counselling other pastors, gathered around him and what he's saying is pray for Christ and he's saying preach for Christ for Christ's glory do all for Christ beware of men pleasing I think that's so important because there's so many temptations to be man-centered in the ministry today and that's what where Rutherford helps us then I would take the pastor also to Rutherford when he's preaching and to hear him passionately commending Christ to sinners and and how it warms the heart and how uplifting it is to preacher and hearer alike. And then we would go outside a house and there Rutherford would be in his favourite place, sitting on the horse's drinking trough by the door with poor people gathered around him. And he would be speaking to them individually about their precious souls. And the last scene that I would take the pastor to is the deathbed of someone who's the same age as, uh, as Rutherford. Uh, and he's dealing with the dying man tenderly and comfort uh, and with, 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 with comfort, but not until he has dealt faithfully with him, not allowing him to rest on any false grounds of confidence for salvation. He does a thorough work, bringing him to repentance and conviction and then um, giving him the comfort of the gospel as well. Matthew, I, d- I don't know what it's like in Scotland, but what I see here in the United States, and incidentally, I resonate with all of that, is we have so, I don't think it's so much we've elevated preaching, but we think of the media figure, the preacher, the uh, and not even the pastor, but the minister and so on. And oh, very ministers less and less deal with people personally as Rutherford did. And do you see that kind of thing in Scotland as well? Yeah, I think that's part of part part of our society as well, where we are becoming much less personally involved with people, and and there's this distance, um, and you know, there's there's less of community, and that, that, there's certainly that fragment fragmentation, and I think it has affected the church, and and one of the things that Rutherford emphasised was Christians gathering together for fellowship. And not just having cups of tea and, and, and talking generally, but but actually speaking about each other's spiritual experience and talking about our, our difficulties and praying with each other and t- talking about you know, the questions to do with the scriptures. So that would be a way in which you know, this uh, fellowship, true spiritual fellowship can can come out as well. Exactly. And and of course, well, we can't be in those groups where Rutherford would be a part. In reading his letters in particular, you learn how he entered into the lives of of the people to whom he ministered, even as our, our Savior did. Well, Jim, now look, you're you're a minister right here in the USA. So what what should American pastors in particular learn from Samuel Rutherford? Well, I came upon a quotation from Rutherford in one of his letters, 1636. This is just at the time he's about to be exiled from uh, the southwest up to to Aberdeen. And others in his congregation are suffering uh, political and and persecution, really. Uh, But he wrote this. 
if his glory, that's the glory of Christ, if Christ's glory be seen in me, I am satisfied, for I lack no kindness from Christ. And I think what impresses me about that simple statement is that Rutherford wants to see the theory of the gospel evidenced in his own life because he wants to see it evidenced in everybody's life. Not enough to talk about Christ. We say, what is it? We don't want to just know about the Savior. We want to know the Savior. Um, Rutherford is an example to others, and I think pastors need to learn from this, uh, uh, then and now. And, And he's an example even to himself as he reflects upon the way in which God is dealing with him in his own life both in the good times and the bad. Um, I I would put it this way. This is my word, not Rutherford's. Seek to experience what you preach and preach what you experience. And I think that would go a long way to changing, uh, the. frankly, at times, what I sense in American Protestantism so often is routine dullness. Uh, the Christian life is a process of living, it's seeking holiness and yearning for eternity with the Savior. It's not just a chore to be dealt with or an issue to be raised. Uh, it's not just an end leading to something else. We've been called to live this life. That's our task. I'm not called to live in the 17th century. I'm not called to live in any other century. I'm called to live now. And Rutherford serves as an example, I think, to us and to all pastors of what it means to be satisfied in Christ because we lack no kindness from him. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, Rutherford was always going back to Jesus Christ as the God-man. And you'll wonder, how can we be nonchalant about the fact that we're dealing with, with the, 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 the God who created the universe and redeemed us, who takes flesh and dwells among us? Yeah, ex- excellent. Um, okay, let's now. Now let's get to a little, little bit more of a delicate topic. Okay, I, I've got to confess, and I was looking today at my 365 uh, letter edition of Rutherford, which is well marked and well read. However, uh, Rutherford can be difficult to read. Although Matthew, your your book, The King and His Beauty, and others provide helpful notes, uh, especially to explain words that are unusual to us. But Matthew. Why don't you give us, your work is to take these things from the past and and make them more accessible to the 21st century. Give us some helps for reading Rutherford. Yeah, I think you, you need to read slowly and also to just try and absorb what, what what's there. The, the, the thing about Rutherford is it, it's not just you. Um, it, it's not just the person. I think everyone finds it uh, a challenge in some ways. There's always some words that are actually unique to Rutherford, you know, that you don't find them anywhere else. And and so it, it's always going to be a challenge on some level. But I think if you're completely new to Rutherford, I would recommend one of two books over and above what you've what you're offering. And one is The Loveliness of Christ. And that's also published by The Banner of Truth. And that just presents in a really nicely presented um, gift volume selections of quotations from Rutherford's letters. But perhaps even more accessible is a book which has just not long come out, and it's called Daily Thoughts from Samuel Rutherford by Reformation Press here in the UK. And that book gives you a, a thought from day, for, for, for each day from Samuel Rutherford. He's got the 365 letters, but this is a uh, a thought for each day is much, much shorter than reading a whole letter. And it explains and defines difficult words. And, of course, it gives you a brief daily boost to your devotional life. Yeah. M- mention, the, mention the two books again, Matthew, and, and the publishing companies, please. Sure. So that's The Loveliness of Christ by the Banner of Truth and Daily Thoughts from Samuel Rutherford by Reformation Press. And, and let me mention again the books that we're making available. And, and Jim, in, in just a moment, I, I want your input on, on this as well. It's very important. But also making Rutherford, Samuel Rutherford, accessible to you is uh, the volume that, that Matthew Vogan edited and, and introduced. It's in the, actually in the Profiles and Reformed Spirituality series, The King in His Beauty, the Piety of Samuel Rutherford, with, with excerpts from his sermons and messages 
I, I cannot overstate what a wonderful introduction this is to Rutherford as a minister, and we're thankful to Reformation Heritage Books for making a few copies of that available for us to give away. And then likewise, our friends at the Banner of Truth Trust, who, along with the loveliness of Christ, have a somewhat larger volume, uh, 69 of, of Rutherford's 365 letters, the letters of Samuel Rutherford. This is the, these, are, these are selected ones, part of the Puritan paperback series. But if you would like one or the other of, of these books, uh, just contact me at visitpastorbill at gmail.com and give us your name and mailing address, and we'd be glad, we'll be thrilled <laughs> to send you a copy uh, so that you can, so you can learn more of, of the, of the uh, wonderful example of Christ-centered piety in Samuel Rutherford. Jim, you wrote in, in our correspondence that, quote, Samuel Rutherford ought to be read in small doses. Give us some suggestions. Tell us, how do you, how do you read Rutherford? Well, I remember when I took New Testament Greek, uh, they they made much of the fact that you should study a little bit every day, not a whole long time once a week. And I think that's the same kind of thing here. Uh, small doses regularly. Uh, I use the uh, Banner of Truth hardbound edition with all 365, and while not this year, previous years, I've gone through one letter a day for a whole year, and that's really been a good discipline. Matthew's book has 43 sections in it. Well, you could read one a day for a month and a half or one a week for almost a year. Um, Something that's regular that you keep going back to, I think that's the essence. It's not a matter of just gaining the information, uh, gaining the... uh, the wisdom, well, that's there, but, but it's, it's becoming a part of it, having it become a part of you. The other thing Matthew's already mentioned, and I think this is true, read slowly. There's no rush here. We're not going anywhere. Um, and thirdly, Jim Packer has a, a book that he write, wrote about John Owen, and he acknowledges that John Owen is difficult to read. And what he says is, if you're having problems understanding it, read it out loud. Yes. Yes, and that's absolutely. a tremendously helpful thing for Owen, and I think it's true for Rutherford as well. Just read it out loud, focus on it, go back to it, and above all things, remember you're looking for a record of a man's experience of Christ. Yeah, yeah. And when you find that in someone, I think you have both a challenge, which makes my own spiritual walk at times an agony, but you also have a great joy that Rutherford, in all of the problems that he faced, he could come back to Christ. So read it, read it regularly, read it slowly, read it out loud, and just keep working at it. Remember, folks, you're not you're not eating a White Castle hamburger with Samuel <laughs> Rutherford. It's a it's a prime steak, and you want to eat it accordingly. Hey, Matthew, about a, you've got about a minute left or so. Tell us a little bit more about your work and how you can be contacted. Sure. Um... Well, I, I work for Reformation Scotland, and one of the things uh, we do, as, as you've mentioned, is to is to take some of these rich resources like Samuel Rutherford and, and those of his time and, and try and bring that language up to date and take excerpts um, and then put them into a format that, that people can, can make use of. Um, so on our website, reformationscotland.org, you'll find weekly articles that – are trying to take material from people like Rutherford and connect it with our needs uh, in the 21st century in our context and to mine the riches of the past for resources for the church today. Um, So on there you can see, if you go down the right-hand side, you can see you could even click on Rutherford's name and it'll bring up all the resources that we've got where we've we've produced things in, in connection with Samuel Rutherford. So you can either contact me through the website or you can contact me on my email address, which is Matthew, two T's, at reformationscotland.org. So that's reformationscotland, all one word, reformationscotland.org. Excellent. I commend, I commend the website to you, rich with resources. Hey, thanks so much, Matthew Vogan and Jim Campbell, for being with us today. Let's take a moment as we wrap things up for just a little message from the pastor's study. I want to remind you of what Paul writes in chapter 16 of the Bible book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 16, 22 to 24. Powerful words. If anyone does not love the Lord, that is the Lord Jesus, 
Let him be eternally condemned, accursed. And then he says, our Lord, come. Then he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. And he says, my love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Let me give you a couple of cautions as a pastor. And and they've both been mentioned in different ways during the program. One is mysticism. Mysticism is trying to think about Christ apart from the Bible. And if that's what you're doing, that's like adoring or trusting in a cloud. Uh, You've got to know Christ as he's made known in the scriptures. Now the other, as Pastor Campbell had mentioned, my word here is intellectualism, which is the Bible apart from Jesus Christ. Uh, that's, That's like equating a love manual with love for your spouse. Rather, you're meant to come to love Christ through the scriptures. Or as Pastor Campbell said, we love a person, not an it or a thing. Now that's interesting that in this text, loving the Lord Jesus is connected with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is that? Grace is everything that God in Christ offers and gives to change our hearts, to make us new creatures in Christ, to continue to cause us to follow the Lord Jesus as the earth revolves around the sun, in order to eat the gifts that were given to serve him, all that is involved in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, behind which is the love of God in Christ. Dwell on that. We love him because he first loved us. And as surely as you are hearing this message, as surely as you read the Bible and hear it preached, that's God holding out his love for you, calling you to embrace that, as Samuel Rutherford so beautifully called people to do. And and then Paul speaks of of, of my love and of our love in this text. And, and we often miss this. The love of Christ who is in heaven, who sends the Holy Spirit, that love is meant to be demonstrated by the love of Christians to one another and to those around them, and especially by the love of Christian ministers, as we heard in the program, the way Rutherford would gather in a public place and and, and just represented the Lord Jesus as as the great shepherd of the sheep. And And so pastors, keep that in mind when Paul says, my love, my love, be with you all in Christ Jesus. Let that pure and beautiful love and grace and kindness of the Lord Jesus Christ work itself out through you so the people can say, Christ visited me in you when you visited me. Now, to stoke the fires, use devotional literature that that stokes the fire of your love for Christ. And there is no better place to start and frankly to use for the, for the rest of your life than the devotional writings and letters of Samuel Rutherford. Just one more quotation from Rutherford. He says, God has given to you to suffer for him. Esteem it as an act of free grace. You are no loser when you have Christ. And if you prize Christ, nothing can be bitter to you. And if you'd like more of that, again, our two books that we're offering the letters, and when you request one or the other, the letters of Samuel Rutherford from our the friends at the Banner of Truth Trust, or The King and His Beauty, edited and introduced by Matthew Vogan from our friends at Reformation Heritage Books. Our thanks to Matthew Vogan and to Jim Campbell for their time with us today. Again, if you'd like those books, send your name, and one or the other, send your name and your address to Visit Pastor Bill. That's my address. Please put it down, Visit Pastor Bill at gmail.com, visit Pastor Bill at gmail.com. And remember again that if you have text questions about any of these subjects, you can text me during the week, 516-367-0391. We appreciate your feedback or your questions. Again, email me, visit Pastor Bill at gmail.com. Remember, tomorrow is the Lord's Day. It is the Christian Sabbath. Be sure to set apart time to worship the Lord in a church that is faithful to the Word of God. And remember, too, everyone, everyone needs a pastor. Lord, we have spoken about revival. Grant a revival by the Holy Spirit in which love for Christ is inflamed. We pray in his name. Amen. 
You've been listening to A Visit to the Pastor's Study, a ministry of Reformation Metro New York. Our website is www.reformationmetrony.org. Again, that's www.reformationmetrony.org. For more information on the program, check out our website at www.visitthepastorsstudy.org. That's www.visitthepastorsstudy.org. Listen in next week at 12 noon for another edition of A Visit to the Pastor's Study. Remember, everyone needs a pastor.